Joe Wright probably has watched a lot of Paul Thomas Anderson movies and doesn't understand why this works. <laughs> He's trying to do it, but he doesn't understand why it works. And it's funny. It, I mean, it, it, it's just funny. I mean, like, it, it, you know, Joe Wright's best movie since, like, what, Atonement or something is probably Darkest Hour. Well, definitely Darkest Hour. Definitely. And, and because of Gary Oldman, not because of him. And, like, there's a scene in Darkest Hour where, like, you know, it, you know they've got Winston Churchill walking into a room and then he goes into an adjacent room and he sits down and he, like, scribbles something real quick and then he gets up and he walks out and he walks into the room that he came in from previously and then walks into another room and the camera follows him. And I'm like, uh, why the fuck did he even go into that room? And it's because Joe Wright is like, oh, I really want to do like a PTA or a Quentin Tarantino or a Steven Spielberg type water. So I've got the camera movement figured out, but I, I, I have no idea what the fucking character is supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, like, so, hey, Gary, just, just, just walk in there and do something so my camera can do something. That's something that Paul Thomas Anderson does well. It's something that Scorsese does well. It's something that Spielberg does better than anybody else. It's something that, uh, well, yeah, I'll just leave it at those three. I, 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 I actually have my fingers out right now at the moment. Kind of, kind of people <laughs> do this really well. Like, just they know how to block actors, and then they, you know, they block the actors, and then they block the camera to the actor. <laughs> and uh, Paul Thomas Anderson is somebody who knows how to just design a scene where the characters are doing are given stuff to do that makes sense which guides the camera so you're not watching the camera movement and thinking ooh this is a really uh, cool shot that the director came up with you're watching the actors because they were actually given shit to do that makes sense that they would be doing it at that moment and the camera is just following them. The camera is just doing what the camera needs to do. And it's doing it as well as it can possibly do it. PTA is somebody who has figured that out. And he's good at it. And there are a lot of directors out there who still haven't figured that shit out. Yeah, no, it's definitely uh, like when we did the Northman, uh, I definitely saw like... Uh that Eggers was uh, trying to do some stuff like that too. Like a lot of movement, a lot of tracking shots and, uh, and it's good. It's good, but it's, it's not there yet. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not like the, uh, like you said, and by the way, Scorsese is okay. Uh, he's not as nearly as consistent as like, as far as camera movement, like he definitely no, no. does a lot of fancy stuff, but, but I think Paul Thomas Anderson, Spielberg, uh, Tarantino to some degree, but Nolan, Fincher, those yeah. are like the top four. I, I wouldn't count Tarantino as far as camera movement, but like top four, like the, the Nolan, Spielberg, Fincher, and Paul Thomas Anderson. I don't think anybody knows how to move a camera. Uh, I mean, I, I would put Kubrick in that category, but he didn't do it as much um, for yeah. sure. And there's some older directors too that were very good at it, but um obviously Hitchcock, but, but yeah, there's some people that just really know how to move the camera. Yeah, and, um, I, I, I mean, there, there are certain people who have pulled off, uh, like oneers that, uh, you know, like I can point to that one shot and be like, Holy fuck. You know, like, uh, there, there's that, uh, shot from episode three of, uh, the first season of true detective. I will, I will not try to pronounce the name of the director the same guy who directed uh the last james bond movie but there's a oneer in that episode that i i mean i shit you not i watched it and 
I, I mean, as a trained eye, got through the entire sequence that was like six or seven minutes, and it was just like, I turned to my girlfriend at the time, and I don't think they cut. Wait, what? What? Yeah, like, yeah, it, it, what? Let's check. <laughs> like, we rewatched the scene, and like, yeah, yeah, they didn't cut. It was that, that fluid, that perfect. <laughs> It was that well designed. Uh, 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 the cinematographer is Adam Arkapal, so I, I can pronounce that guy's name. But uh, I mean, there are people who can pull it off every so often and just do it so well that it just blows your freaking mind. But when it comes to the Wonder, Steven Spielberg, as far as I can tell, is the greatest of them all. Because yeah. he, he's not self-indulgent. He's not the guy who's like, okay, I'm going to break a record. Uh, you know, he's the guy who's going to be like, okay, well, we're going, uh, uh, we're going to hold the shot. And, okay, 55 seconds. Or, uh, oh, 56 seconds. That's when it works. Cut. We've got another shot. <laughs> We can move in, you know, like, and I mean, a 56 second long take is actually relatively long in cinema. A lot of people don't realize that <laughs> but Spielberg is the master of it. And he, I, I think he'll die the master of it. And I hope he doesn't die for a lot of years, but <laughs> I don't know how many more movies he's got than the, it's probably a few more. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I was gonna say is that I I I, uh, I listened to a podcast with uh, like uh, Bill Maher was talking to Tarantino, and right, Bill I Maher. Saw that one too. Oh, I saw, saw that. And <clears throat> think about the 1917, like he's gushing yeah. all over it, and yeah. Tarantino was like, ah, you know. And I think Tarantino has a good point. Like 1917 was a great example of a movie that was obviously on the surface should be insanely impressive, and it was, but you know. Could the execution of those shots and the decisions about where to place the camera at any point been better? Way, way better. Like it's uh, the, they basically followed the action. There's some good angles there, but it's no Spielberg level of uh, <laughs> moving the camera or, or or a Paul Thomas Anderson. It's adequate, and they hide the cuts so it looks impressive. But but the content that you're getting is. Um, wasn't nearly as captivating as you would hope it would be because because what spielberg does and paul thomas anderson too and is the the oneers that have multiple shots within them you go from the wide to the close-up to the this to the that like you know it's all very um you know kinetic as opposed to just like you know we're here we're staying here we're not going anywhere you know type of thing um mm -hmm. But and staging choreography, like all that stuff, is so underappreciated. Like with both Paul Thomas Anderson and uh, and Spielberg, like the way they uh, the um they they block the scenes is just like just amazing. Uh, I mean, yeah. this is why I think that a lot of uh, people who want to be filmmakers should uh, take some classes in theater. Because, you know, in theater, you don't get a camera where you can just, you know, move into a close up. I mean, if you've got a long dialogue scene, you have to be creative and find ways to get people to move around and make it interesting. So people aren't just looking at a stage with like two people talking to each other for five minutes. Uh, you know, it, it it's a good idea to have a sense of staging uh you know in every aspect I, I i also think that paul verhoeven is kind of underrated oh yeah you know area. i stumbled on uh on like oh, a fantastic. few minutes of robocop yesterday yeah. i rewatched robocop two weeks ago oh yeah you know, two days ago it was actually but but yeah i i saw the i i stumbled onto the scene um it's funny because nowadays, like with streaming, they'll have like live channels, quote unquote, uh -huh. that would call them because like, oh, this movie's going on. So I'll, I'll mm -hmm. click and see what scene it's at. And um, and it was the boardroom scene where the, uh, the, the they introduced the, uh, you know, what's the call? The, 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 
Yeah, yeah, the one and the, the one that shoots the, uh, yeah. the one Fantastic of the executive. Scene. Fantastic scene. But the one thing that I I, I never noticed before, obviously, because I saw it when I was younger, is like there's like a really long, complicated like take of like the travel the whole boardroom from one person to the other. They switch from one to the other. I'm like mm-hmm. this is like a you know a, a a sleazy action movie from the 80s like it, this was not necessary but but yes verhoven definitely has those those touches of yeah. those wonders from time to time it stuck out to me when i was reading the american cinematographer article on uh there will be blood way back in the day which amazingly is uh, uh what 13 years ago 14 years ago um, and Robert Ellswit was talking about how Paul Thomas Anderson hates grain. He hates film grain. And when you look at the technical specs on Paul Thomas Anderson's films, uh, surely enough, uh, yeah, he never shot anything, uh, any film stock faster than 200 ISO. Yeah. In, in uh, case uh, people need to know. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, until after the master. He shot the master in 2012. Oh, that, that was also on 70. Yeah, and that was shot on 70. So even less green. Right. And everything was still shot with 200 ISO film or less. 2012 was the year that Kodak filed chapter 11 bankruptcy his next film after that was inherent vice and that was the first time that he actually shot 500 iso film it is a pretty grainy movie paul thomas anderson has been pretty vocal i mean not as vocal as quentin tarantino or christopher nolan about film about shooting on film rather than shooting digital. But at the same time, he had been pretty vocal, at least within the industry, of not liking film grain. So up until Kodak filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy, he was shooting anamorphic 35mm film, and he wasn't shooting anything faster than 200 ISO stock, which meant that he, I mean, like, he was really pushing light into those fucking scenes. I I mean, like, when you look at There Will Be Blood, and, like, the like, the, the, the oil derrick going up in fire and everything like that, and knowing that he was shooting that on 200 ISO stock, if you know anything about photography, that's rough. Like you're, you're really going full bore of like, okay, we're just minimizing grain. Then Kodak goes into bankruptcy. Inherent Vice is the first movie that he makes after that. That's the first movie that he shoots on 500 ISO stock. Robert Ellswick comes back. He's shooting it. And since then, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson has either served as his own cinematographer or as a co-cinematographer on each of his subsequent films. And each of his subsequent films have used high-speed film stocks with a lot of grain. I'm kind of thinking that that year of 2012 might have been his moment of like, okay, Cost of film went through the roof. I want to make this movie. Inherent Vice wasn't a mega budget. wasn't a mega budget movie. It wasn't like the Master. I mean, I, I don't think the Master was like particularly financially successful. Um. So, I I actually think that he might have gone into Inherent Vice with this feeling of like, okay, am I going to stick to film or am I going to stick to my hatred for grain? And he stuck with film. 
and he doubled and tripled down on film ever since then. Because, I mean, that's the only that's the only thing that I can connect. Because, I mean, I've been listening to everything that he says. I've been reading everything that I can get. Uh, I mean, I, I, he's expressed his hatred for for film grain. He's said that you know, like, it, I, I, he actually said at one point, uh, you know, comparing himself to Tarantino and Nolan, like those guys are out to like slit throats, and I'm, I'm not really in that category, but I love film. I really think that that was his breaking point where he was just like, I'm just going to commit to film. And, you know, you know, screw it if it's grainy. You know, I, I, I just love film. I, I just love what film gives me as an image. Uh, that That's just what I'm finding in terms of his um, uh, behavior. And, uh, uh, I mean, and particularly since he has since started uh, uh serving as his own cinematographer, I mean, using faster film does make it easier on you. You know, you don't have to, uh, yeah, you, know, you can light scenes more to your eye than you, than you would if you're shooting everything at 200 ISO and it's supposed to be a dark scene and everything. But, um, that really might've been a transformative moment in his career. And just to clarify, Matt, um, what you're essentially saying is that you agree with that decision. <laughs> that was a very long way of saying that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, as as somebody who just bought a 4 by 5 camera, yes. Uh, I, I think you might be reading a little bit too much into this. Um, I mean, I, I personally think that, uh, uh, for one thing, like, after there will be blood, there was a a rush of like digital cinema. Like it became very big. Yeah. I think it was like 2010 or so where the Alexa came out and stuff. So that's when it became like huge. And um, and he pushed back against it. So did Tarantino. Um, mm. Both of them shot movies on 70 millimeter, right? I think it was like uh, Hateful Eight, and. Um, and um, yeah, and he shot the master on 70 millimeter because there was this like, oh, you're going digital because you like a sharp image. Well, I'll shoot on 70 and my image will be even sharper than yours. You know, <laughs> that that kind of a yeah. thing. Um, I, and, and, you know, and Nolan with the IMAX bullshit, whatever. <clears throat> but in any case, um, <laughs> so dismissive. <laughs> no, come hey, on. I might be. Uh, I might be working on Oppenheimer this this yeah, summer. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Uh, but at least don't change the the, the formatting yeah. mid scene. That's like. <laughs> sure. In any case, um, it's just unnecessary. You can get like an image without the grain, even with thirty five. Just yeah, shoot two hundred ISO, whatever. But I, I do think that what what happened is that the the appeal of digital cameras is that they make life easier and it's easier to light uh it's it's it just frees you up to be more creative and 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 maybe and not only that but also i think that he he also wants to run the gamut of what film can do like what what this film can do like what he realized like yeah i wanted the sharp image but then my 70 millimeter movie kind of looks digital because it's such a clean image but what does film do that digital can't do is look dirty. And uh, and especially when he does a lot of period pieces because he, he made like Phantom Thread in Mariner and Vice and, and now he did this. It just it made sense um, to go grainy and to, to show the difference between that and what digital movies look like, to differentiate his movies somehow because the, the doing the master didn't really do the trick. He tried it out. I'm sure it just was cumbersome and made his life difficult. So he just kind of backtracked and went in the opposite direction. And also he's been doing a lot of music videos, which is where I think he kind of became more and more comfortable shooting his own stuff. Mm. And yes, when you're shooting your own stuff and directing, you want to make, I've done that once, more than once even. 
And uh -huh. um, you want to make things as easy as possible on you. And uh, and one of the ways is, yeah, higher ISO, uh, you know, smaller cameras. And um, and then you work it into the story by if it's a periodic piece, then you do that. I think Phantom Thread, he did shoot some scenes, uh, 200, maybe it was the exteriors. But um, but but yeah, I mean, it's yeah, that one is yeah. not as grainy as as Inherent Vice and, and Licorice Pizza, but it's still got some grain, yeah, for sure. No, I, I I mean, I didn't say that he stopped shooting slower films. I, I'm just saying that he started utilizing faster films. Uh, yeah, he, I really he, think it yeah. was like the the bounce back from the master. It was like, well, you know, that's what that looks like but what else can film do that is not like digital and, and grain is one of the big things that it's tough to match some digital movies can make it look fairly close but it's but it's not the same it doesn't have the same raw quality to it question yeah okay boogie nights also took place roughly the same time period as mm -hmm. licorice pizza why does it look better look better you mean as far as the quality of the image or sure uh, no I, I think uh, again it's just it's a better looking choice. movie not necessarily well for one oh. thing it was again he was he's lighting his own movie here for sure so it it looks different there he had a cinematographer yeah but, well, uh, it was robert Ellswitz. So. Yeah, yeah yeah and and i think he was going for a different type of thing with this movie which is why maybe he chose to have robert Ellswitz on um on you know on inherent vice but not this because he was going for this like very stripped down raw look uh, i mean phantom thread is also pretty stripped down it's it's slightly more uh elegant looking than than licorice pizza but licorice pizza really goes for this like we said grainy like uh raw ha a lot of handheld stuff like very like uh feeling of uh yeah like loose feeling of and the filmmaking where uh, boogie nights was very much like a kind of like a magnum opus like it was doing a lot of like steady cam shots it, it, the quality was just good like just just really good of the image like a lot of different color usage and and lighting it, it was still very it was still like looked like a 70s type of feel but but it didn't go as extreme as licorice pizza but i was just a decision at the time he was like a new filmmaker he probably just wanted to make it look professional where here he's got more freedom he's like i've done that what am i gonna just do boogie nights again i'm gonna do something more raw and more like nutty than than what boogie nights was yeah. you know i, I, I mean uh also just kind of a, a an ultra nerdy take um given uh when Boogie Nights came out, that was, uh, I think that was in the EXR stock era of Kodak. Uh, so, I, I, like, this is the thing that drives me nuts. Like, you, know, Jason, you remember when we shot Madeline? Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I, I chose the Kodak Vision One stock, even though we were already on Kodak Vision Three for a reason. I mean, like. Yeah, the the blacks in older Kodak stocks were just glorious. You know the contrast, the the and even though we were shooting black and white on the head, I mean like the the color was just different. You know, like the as film stocks evolved over the course of like our careers, everything was going toward more dynamic range and more kind of pastel colors. Uh, you know, uh, you know, moving more toward uh, digital post-production processes. Uh, and, uh, and obviously Boogie Nights predated all that. So, I mean, the film stocks that they had back then were film stocks that were meant to you know, look gorgeous the moment that you printed them <laughs> and you needed to get everything right on set. And it's, I, I think it's just a different, it, it, I, I think that the entire mentality has changed 
since Boogie Nights. Uh, I mean, really, since um, uh, Oh Brother, Where Are Thou actually kind of changed the entire film industry in that it was the first feature film that was actually finished with the digital intermediate. Since then, both film stocks and digital capture formats have just entirely shifted. 